Chapter 1. The Afterlife. Summer 2021. Death approached through unfamiliar sounds in a perpetual blackness. Incessant rhythmic beeps accompanied hushed voices to either side of Robert. Someone held his hand, gently stroking it. Drifting like a boat lightly tethered to the dock, Robert's consciousness betrayed him, drowning him in confusion. I wish I could see his face the moment he experienced his color again. A male voice, deep and somber, spoke from the right. Yes. A miserable life of blindness. Robbed of what was most precious. Just let me go now. Let this cursed blindness end. A vague memory of going to the hospital surfaced through the darkness of his mind. He was used to darkness, but this, somehow, was different. More disorienting. He lived a full life, despite everything. He wouldn't tell you that responded a soothing, feminine voice. He'd say it was half life at best. There was sadness in that comment. Where did he know that voice? He strained at his memory, grasping at mist, finding nothing. Beeping pressed into his awareness, pulling him back into the moment. The whispers ceased and the grip on his hand tightened. An alarm blared at the single unbroken tone to the left as everything slipped away. Everything except the grip on his hand. That remained, and somehow, felt more real. The transition here is going to be difficult. Yes, a soft voice whispered. He's holding on to too much, and not enough. Chapter 2 The Artwork Spring 1984 Children laughed and splashed each other under the less-than-watchful eyes of parents casually eating their lunches by the fountains. The spring air pleasantly tickled the tall, swaying palm trees like terra verte fan brushes painting a crystal blue sky. The excitement in the air was palpable, buzzing in anticipation of the fast-approaching Summer Olympics in Los Angeles. Everyone seemed to be talking about Russia's boycott and what that would mean for America's athletes. New and beautiful buildings were finalizing their construction and old ones were being renewed. Robert, finishing his usual lunch outside the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, felt excitement bounce around his chest. Yet his excitement was not for the Olympics. Well, not really. He didn't care much for the politics and undercurrents of the Cold War. While it was fun to watch the competitions, that wasn't what he was looking forward to. The Olympics had created an opportunity for him. The museum was opening a new exhibit as part of the Olympic Art Festival in June, only a few months away. He had worked hard as a member of the committee, striving to bring foreign classical paintings to L.A. Because of those efforts, the committee had identified several French Impressionist paintings to feature. Now, the upcoming exhibit, A Day in the Country, Impressionism and the French Landscape, would be a fresh opportunity to stretch Robert's restoration skills on some recently discovered mid-19th century pieces. Cars drove past the LACMA along the Miracle Mile in splashes of cherry red, chrome yellow, brilliant orange, pastel white, and marina blue. But today, Robert watched for a familiar brown with gold lettering. He scheduled his lunch break during the typical noon delivery in hopes that he would be present when it arrived. Luck was drawing thin as he watched the tiny hands on his watch tick past the time he needed to return to work. Oh well he thought as he gathered up his Tupperware and walked back into the museum. Large shipments rarely occurred when expected. Why would this one be any different? Two hours later, after unproductive and unfocused work on various side projects, the page boy finally knocked on Robert's door, alerting him to the crate's arrival. In his excitement, he dismissed the young man and rushed through the museum like a schoolboy racing through the halls, dodging the principal's watch. The crate stood alone in the receiving bay like a child waiting for a parent in an empty train station. Robert quickly strapped it onto a dolly and carted it up to his office. The unboxing couldn't go fast enough. Anticipation gnawed at him, but he cautiously held back to avoid costly mistakes. This wasn't some birthday gift from childhood with an audience of eager eyes waiting to see what was behind brightly colored wrapping paper. There wasn't an audience at all. Just him, a wood crate, and a hammer and pry bar to get it open. Robert paused. It was always more exciting to share this moment with someone. Briefly, the memory of his ex-wife standing with him for some of his first unboxings ran through his memory, flooding him with longing, loneliness, bitterness, 
and insecurity. Stuffing the unwanted feelings down, Robert walked to the phone and punched in his sister's number. Hello? A soft, friendly voice answered. Sandra, it arrived. What arrived? Robert, is that you? Yes, you know, the French piece I've been telling you about. It arrived at the museum just a few minutes ago. I was about to open it up and wondered if you wanted to be here to see it. Robert tried to stifle his excitement. Oh, sorry, Robert. I've got to pick up Bobby from school and take him to a soccer game in just a few minutes. There's no way I could come. Thanks for thinking of me, though, Sandra said. Her voice was genuine, as always. Let me know about it tonight. Are you coming over for dinner? No, I'll probably work late, Robert answered, a little crestfallen. I'm going to get the painting ready to start the restoration tomorrow. Thanks. Tell Bobby hi for me and give him a hug. Sandra laughed. Okay, will do. Bye, Robert. Robert hung up the phone in the cradle and looked around. He wanted to open it up, but the disappointment of not having anyone to share the experience with slowed his movements. The loneliness pressed on him like a dark cloud, dampening the excitement. He walked back to the table and began to work the pry bar to open the case. The top pulled away easily and revealed layers of styrofoam. The familiar smell of it reignited his enthusiasm. A knock interrupted his work as he started to pull back the white, squeaky foam. Come in, Robert called out, now eager to see the painting. A plain-looking woman with dark-rimmed glasses peeked through the door. Robert vaguely remembered her as one of the other restoration artists on the committee. He'd seen her in the halls before, but never really bothered talking to her. I heard the new painting arrived. Have you opened it yet? She asked timidly. Pushing away a twinge of initial annoyance at having been interrupted, Robert smiled politely. Just opening it now. He wouldn't be alone for the reveal after all. That's what he wanted, right? Why had he been bothered when he had just interrupted himself to see if his sister could join him? Again, Robert pushed the thoughts and feelings aside and resumed pulling off the styrofoam. Come in. You can get the first glimpse of it with me. The first thing he noticed was the smell of burnt wood and smoke. Surely it didn't still smell. It had been over fifty years since the fire. Excitement turned to worry as he gently removed the brown wrapping paper. It was dark. The frame was charred all around the edges. Clearly, Robert would need to put in an order for a new frame. He worried about the extra time that would require. The dealer had explained this might be the case. The painting had been damaged in a fire, but that it was salvageable. Concern and irritation flooded him as he noticed a portion of the painting was almost completely obscured in smoke and grime. Was this even going to be worth the effort? Oh my, the woman chirped, bringing her hand to her mouth. You certainly have your work cut out for you. Would you like me to bring you some swabs? No, thank you. I won't have time for cleaning today. I'll just remove the frame and get it prepped for tomorrow, Robert said. Okay, she said. She bent down and looked closely at the painting. You can still see some of the color. I bet it's a beautiful painting. She smiled and looked up. The smile broke the plainness of her face. It somehow complimented her beige dress as her cheeks lifted her glasses. Yes, beautiful, Robert said, momentarily distracted. He returned his gaze to the artwork. He hadn't seen any color, and yet there it was. Some vague approximations of blue and green were peeking through. He could see outlines of trees, shadows contrasted against patches of light. How had he not seen the color? He was good at seeing color. Would you like any help before I go? No, thank you. I can manage, Robert said. Okay, have a nice afternoon, Robert, the woman said, walking out of the office. You too, Robert replied, forgetting her name. He was embarrassed she had remembered his. He hoped she didn't notice the omission. The frame was charred and disfigured. It had been intricately carved at one point in its life, but the detail crumbled at the touch. Black soot stained his fingers, a reminder to put on gloves before he handled the painting. Robert turned it over to look at the back. It wasn't a large painting, only about one and a half by two feet. The joints were in surprisingly good condition, and the back of the painting didn't show as many burn marks. Robert felt some relief as he realized that, while the painting was severely smoke-stained, it hadn't been burned. This was a good sign. The rest of the afternoon was spent carefully removing the frame. 
He was surprised to see brighter colors around the edges of the canvas where the frame had protected it from the smoke. His usual excitement returned as truer colors were revealed. He mulled over whether he would need to remove the canvas. It wasn't as damaged as some of the other works he had restored in the past, though some punctures and a rip extended through the painting a few inches. Robert concluded the canvas would need to be removed from its stretching frame. He read over the commission agreement again for the restoration requirements. As much as possible without changing the integrity of the original painting, it read. He sniffed a bit at that. He wasn't an amateur. He would never compromise the integrity of the original painting. Chapter 3 The Accident January 1996 Thanks for showing us the new exhibit, Robert. It's really impressive, a young man in his mid-twenties said. A middle-aged woman, dressed in the fashion of the younger generation, stood by him, smiling in agreement. All three stood several feet back from a large painting, admiring the artist's attention to light and color. Yes, thank you, the woman said. She stepped closer to Robert and whispered, This is just what he needed. The breakup was really hard on him. He needed a good distraction. Well, it's my pleasure spending time with my favorite sister and nephew, Robert smiled at them. She's your only sister, Bobby said, smiling back. I admit, that did make it an easier choice. Robert looked back at the painting, squinting a bit. I wish it was that easy to see the details on this piece. Put your glasses on, then, Sander chided. It's not the same. I miss the crispness I used to see. With glasses, there's always a glare on the inside of the lens. It's like looking through a window at a masterpiece, but having it obscured by your own reflection. You guys are old, Bobby teased. When I was your age... He mocked in an old grandpa voice. Robert's teasing backhand to Bobby's stomach cut him off and he stepped back laughing. Watch out, you young whippersnapper. I've still got old man strength. Boys, they never grow up, even when they get older, Sandra muttered, rolling her eyes. Seriously, though, Robert, I hear you complain all the time about how you can't see stuff anymore. Isn't that kind of important for your work? I see everything up close just fine so it doesn't affect the restoration work at all. It's only a problem when I step back to look at the whole piece, Robert answered. Sounds pretty important to me, Bobby chimed in. Well, have you tried contacts? That would fix the glare, Sandra asked. They don't make bifocal contacts, Robert grumbled. My prescription doesn't work up close. Everything just goes fuzzy. It wouldn't work. Have you thought of LASIK? Sandra said. Have I thought of whom? Not a person. It's a new corrective eye surgery. It uses lasers, so it's more precise. It's just out of clinical trials. They say it can restore 20-20 vision. You should look into it. You want me to let a doctor shine lasers in my eyes to fix my vision? That doesn't sound logical, Robert retorted. They walked along to the next painting, pausing again to appreciate the work. Squinting, Robert asked, How much does it cost? I'm not sure. Probably 2500 or so per eye. Maybe a little more, Sandra said, no longer looking at the painting. She could tell his interest was piqued, but wondered how he would react to the cost. Huh, <laughs> he puffed, now looking back at Sandra. Will insurance cover it? Sandra winced. I'm not sure. I just heard about it recently. If I had to guess, I'd say probably not. It's still very new. What's the recovery time? If I did it, how long would I have to take off work? That's the great thing about it, Robert. Because it's lasers, it's really precise. Most people are seen clearly in a day or two. It's pretty remarkable. She was reeling him in. More than $5,000. Completely out of pocket. I don't have that kind of money just laying around. I think I'll stick to squinting. Sandra's shoulders fell. She knew pressing the issue would probably have an opposite effect than she wanted. Instead, she walked close to him and put her arm around his waist. He looked down at her and instinctively wrapped his arm around her shoulder, giving her a hug. They held each other in silence, looking at the painting. Robert broke the embrace, taking a few steps forward, arms behind his back, leaning in to the painting. I love this one. The way the artist captures the sun's rays on the subject is just magical. The trio walked around the gallery together for the rest of the afternoon. It was like a dance. Sidestep, pause, step in, step back waltzing through each room. They chatted and laughed, reflecting together in hushed, mostly reverent tones. 
As they exited into the main lobby, late afternoon sunlight shone through the windows. Robert, Bobby paused, looking at his uncle with a thoughtful intensity. You're an art restorer. Last I checked. Funny. But seriously, your job requires your sight. You see things that my eyes just aren't trained to see. That's why I love coming to the art museum with you. You help me see things I wouldn't see otherwise. I appreciate the artwork so much more when I'm with you. Well, thank you, Robert said, a little surprised at Bobby's sudden sentimentality. But I've been wondering, if I had come up to you earlier today and asked how much you would be willing to pay to have your sight completely restored, what would you have said? I mean, what's your sight actually worth to you?